All right, uh, welcome to another video in this series on uh, data structures. Uh, this video is uh, going to be on the topic of lists. Uh, and we're going to look at a couple different kinds of lists. Uh, and then we're going to look at uh, the two most uh, commonly used lists um, and uh, the runtimes associated with some of the operations uh, that we like to perform on those lists. All right, uh, in order to uh, investigate the various abstract data types that we're going to look at in these series, uh, another uh, concept that's going to be important to us is the concept of an invariant. Now, the word invariant uh, uh, means to not vary or to not change. Um, and we use it in a couple different places in computer science uh, to mean usually a set of properties um, that does not change after some transformation. And in our case, uh, the transformations we're going to be interested in are performing operations on a, on a data structure. And the most common operations that we're going to be uh, looking at are adding something to the data structure, uh, deleting something from the data structure. And then uh, fundamentally, we also need to be able to find things in the data structure. Uh, and, and these are different operations uh, that uh, after performing them, we want, might want to make sure that a certain set of properties uh, uh, remains true so that we don't invalidate uh, perhaps how the data structure works. Uh, and these set of properties that, that uh, characterize a data structure uh, will usually wrap together in one, uh, one package and call it an invariant, something that again will not change uh, as we perform operations on that data structure. Uh, all right, in the Java programming language, um, many of the data structures that we're going to be looking at uh, in these videos are organized uh, under one uh, sort of super class that is called collections. And that's uh, to capture uh, sort of one, uh, one invariant, one aspect of the invariant of uh, almost all data structures uh, is that they are collections of data. They take data and package them in some way uh, together and that's what makes them a data structure as opposed to uh, just a, a single atomic uh, a piece of data. Um, and when we are uh, characterizing a particular collection, uh, depending on what kinds of ex expectations we have for how that collection uh, behaves, uh, we may have different types of uh, data structures that embody that type of collection. And so, uh, as we probably know, if we have some experience with Java, you can inherit, or uh, uh, there are many classes that inherit from the collections uh, framework. Um, and he, I've listed a, a number of possible ones you might uh, find here, including stacks, queues, arrays, linked lists, and so on. Some of these other ones are maybe a little more advanced, and we'll take a look at those in, a, in videos uh, down the road. Um, but if we were going to say what is the property or set of properties that every collection has in common, sort of uh, tried to extract that uh, notion here through a process of abstraction here. I've tried to figure out what is the one one characteristic that all collections have in common. And I've already hinted at or I've already stated it. It's that the group of, of uh, elements, the group of objects, the, the collection of data that we have is stored together. The only thing that the collection does for us is bring those pieces of data together into one collection. Um, and that's a pretty, pretty uh, you know, that, that's only one uh, uh, sort of simple characteristic that we've, we've brought in here. And in fact, uh, if we think back to some of our discrete math, uh, uh, we probably realize, well, that collection kind of map maps right onto the notion of a set. A set does the same thing. A set just brings its elements uh, together into one package, one set. Uh, so collections and, and sets sort of have uh, a, an analogy here in this discussion, at least collections as they are set up in Java. Um, I mentioned that uh, it's important when we uh, uh, perform an operation that we want to uh, make sure that a set of properties, the invariant, is not violated. And this is, is just a simple example that perhaps you've encountered uh, before. If you've had the uh, pleasure of uh, implementing a linked list before, um, then one of the more challenging operations 
is to delete a element from, uh, well, just an arbitrary element uh, in the linked list, but maybe more importantly, uh, one of the interior elements, not one of the end elements. The end elements are a little bit easier to work with. With one of the interior elements, if we just delete the element out, it usually uh, leaves a, a gap in the list. We lose a connection. It's important for us to reconnect up one of the references in the linked list after deleting an element. If we do not do that, then this would be a case where we violated the invariant. So, so the steps that we take when we delete this interior element to reconnect the pointers, reconnect the references, so the list uh, uh, is, is back in a functioning form, these are steps we're taking to make sure that the invariant uh, is not violated. Okay, that's just one example. We'll encounter this more. All right, so I want to now talk about the idea of a list uh, we were just talking about the idea of a collection. So what, what property does the list bring uh, uh, to our invariant that the collections all didn't already uh, uh, bring to us? And, and remember, the collection said it's going to bring all the data, the elements, the objects that we have all into one package, one collection, but it didn't do anything else to it. One thing that a list does to that package, that collection, is it imposes an order on the data as well. Even if, if that's not a standard order, there's going to be some specific order, the element that's in position one, the element that's in position two, and so on. So I've extended the collections invariant to define here the list invariant. Here the list invariant, I say, and I've emphasized it, is a, is a collection of objects in some order. And here I've emphasized some, meaning there has to be an order on the data. But which order? Uh, we impose on the data is not stated here. So for instance, I'm not saying um, the data must be stated in uh, ascending order if it's numerical data or in alphabetical order if it is uh, text data. Uh, I'm just saying it has to be in some order. There has to be an element that comes first and one that comes second and third and so on. But which element comes first, second and third and so on, uh, I have left open that. You may fill in that detail if you do, you may be defining a more specific kind of list, um, but I'm uh, for, for just this very general type of list, uh, I'm not going to say what type of order I expect, merely that some order must exist. I think that's what I've stressed here. Um, and as I, I sort of implied, um, from, from a list, we can, from this general definition of a list, we can then add more characteristics if we liked, and that maybe will define other kinds of lists. So I maybe just uh, uh, implied maybe we could keep the elements in ascending order. This would be a sorted list. We sometimes might call that a sorted list or an ordered list, and that would be a specific uh, type of list. It would still be a list because it matches this definition, uh, but it would have more criteria added as well. One criteria uh, that we can add, or one kind of criteria that we can add, um, is an access criteria, telling us how we access the elements of the list. And uh, by adding some access uh, criteria, we can get a couple different kinds of lists, and these are common ones that we've probably encountered before. So here, uh, the first one that maybe I'll mention is uh, the stack uh, invariant. So uh, the stack is a special kind of list uh, and uh, embodied by the stack of plates that, that I've got here. Um, the idea about a stack is that we can only access the elements in the stack from the top. So the top plate is the one that we can take off the stack. Once we've taken it off the stack, we can m now get the one underneath it. In, in a true stack form, if we want to access one of the plates lower down, uh, we first have to remove all of the plates above it before we can get to it. So the stack allows us only to have access at the top of the list, uh, however we define that. Um, and another way we characterize this is in, as a first in, last out access, meaning the first element that we put in the stack is at the bottom. It will also be the last one that we take out because it's at the bottom. So we call this first in, last out access. A lot of operations that we have, uh, in particular in computing, are ones where we will want first in, last out 
uh, processing. Um, a type of processing that we're probably more, uh, more we encounter more often in our daily life is a queue invariant or the queue type of access, which is first in, first out, uh, which we can see here embodied by a queue of people. Um, this queue of people is, uh, you know, uh, per, you know, lining up for any possible thing. Uh, we know that the one in the front was the first one to arrive. Uh, and they will be the first ones served. So this is a similar type as a first come, first serve type of processing. So again, uh, uh, Q actually has access on both ends. We add new elements on the back, but we take out elements from the front. Unlike the stack where new elements get added on the top and, and elements are removed from the top. Everything happens on the top in the, in the stack, but on the Q we have elements coming out of the front and into the back. Um, of course, in programming, uh, we may use stacks and queues for specific tasks, uh, but we're probably more used to using uh, a, different, a more uh, general type of list, like an array list or a linked list, where we have uh, access to maybe all of the elements and not just access to one of the endpoints. Uh, array lists really embody this, giving us what we call index access. Uh, where we're able to access the element if we know its address, the, the index that it lives in. Um, linked list gives us a slightly different kinds of access, which well, we can call iterator access, uh, which is from any one element we can access its neighbors, um, but we, we maybe uh, do not have easy access to just arbitrary elements uh, like we might have in, in array, uh, an array list type of uh, setup. Um, what I would like to do now um, with the rest of the video is to take a closer look at the array list and the link list uh, embodiments of lists and, and look at the differences between them and maybe help us uh, come uh, make some decisions on when it is a good idea to use an array list or a link list or by, and in which situations it might be uh, not a good idea to use an array list or a linked list. So uh, let's continue now um, and to do that I want to maybe look at a little piece of code here. Um, uh, this is Java code but it looks similar to C code so it could be, uh, uh, you can interpret this as in a couple different languages. Um, this line of code uh, declares an array and uh, I want to be maybe uh, specific with this. Uh, it declares uh, a static array. And so I want to draw this as a distinction. Uh, if we were declaring an array list, an array list is something that uh, I will call a dynamic array, and, and we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, but this declares a static uh, array. And so when I say here, what does this line do? What I'm actually asking is what happens in memory when we make uh, a, a when we make a declaration like this? So of course, when we make variable declarations, we're asking uh, the compiler, we're asking the operating system to set aside some memory for us that we can use in our program. And usually, in a declaration, part of that is we're asking for some size of memory. So sim simply put, if we're asking for an integer, integers uh, typically are 32 bits. So what we're asking for is 32 bits of memory or about four bytes of memory. Again, depending on our, our addressing system, that might work in different ways, but we're asking for that amount of memory. Um, when we uh, create a static array like this, we are also asking for a chunk of memory. Uh, but there's a little bit more math that goes on behind the scenes. First of all, the variable here, size, is going to tell us how many integers we want, uh, remembering that each integer is the 4 bytes or the 32 bits. So when we ask uh, the, the operating system to give us memory in this way, we're asking it not just for a single int, but for a collection of ints. And whatever size is, if size is 100, then we would get 100 uh, uh, chunks of memory. Um, the other important thing when we ask the operating system to do this is it will get this memory uh, uh, to be continuous or contiguous in memory, meaning that all of the memory locations uh, are in order. So uh, we store the whole array all in one chunk in, the, in memory. 
So I've got that somewhat visualized here as uh, integer, uh, the first integer will be stored in index 0, the next in index 1, and so on, up to the last one, which I've got labeled here as n minus 1. Okay, so I've asked here how many bytes that is. I've already mentioned that with 32, uh, 32 bits or 4 bytes each, um, we're going to have about size times 4 bytes uh, um, uh, in terms of that's the size of memory that we're going to allocate. One of the benefits that we have to allocating our arrays in this way, one of the reasons why we have, have built our systems to do this, is it makes addressing into the array um, quite, quite simple, actually. Um, the first thing that happens is when we actually allocate this array, um, we do have a reference assigned to our variable ints there. The variable ints gets a reference into memory where it can look up the array. Now where it actually points is to the first, uh, the very first location here, location 0. The pointer is going to point right here. Say we want to find index i. Okay. Um, so i could be any particular index for a moment, but maybe for the moment let's, let's restrict it to i equals 0. Well, what we're going to do, uh, let's say that uh, ARR is our reference. That's the reference to our array. Well, we called it ints over there. Um, but let's say ARR uh, is the address that we've stored our array in. Then if we're looking for index uh, uh, 0, we actually will find it right here in position uh, ARR. So, so no problem. Uh, if we want to look at uh, index um, 1, we're going to actually going to we're going to get a different case here. We're going to get uh, ARR plus, and then we need to be careful here. Well, how far away is uh, I said so I here? I said let's say one. How far away is uh, this this element? Well, according to the uh, image we have up here, it should be right next door. It should be the next element over. Now, how far over is that? Well, it depends on how big. An element we've been storing, and assuming we're using byte addresses here, uh, that's going to be four bytes uh, down the way, or uh, one uh, maybe word size if our word size is 32 here. And then we could continue here. So if we had i equals two, then the location of that element should be arr uh, plus what well, looks like eight, uh, which means just in general, if we have our our uh, any index i here. We could take ARR uh, and we could add to that I looks like times 4. Keeping in mind that when I equals 0, this will all be 0 and we'll just get ARR back. That's what we wanted. And when uh, I equals 1, of course, we get 4 and 2, it's 8 and so on. So we've got the right formula here. Now what this does for us is when we uh, do any index calculations, so now remember here, we, we may have some kind of reference like this. How much time does it take for us to access that array element? Well, it takes as much time as it takes us to do this simple bit of arithmetic here. Okay? And this might look like a lot, but uh, we should keep in mind that for the most part, this is going to be a bit shift. And so since that's going to be a bit shift, um, that's a little bit simpler as a multiplication. And then we've got one addition here as well. That's uh, a little bit of arithmetic we need to do to calculate the index, uh, but that is still a uh, constant time. And that's going to be the main key here, is that the access to those elements then is going to be uh, big O of 1 or constant time access, meaning we can access that element, any element, regardless of the index, with the same number of steps. We actually call this uh, random uh, access. And so uh, you may have heard this term before in terms of this random access memory or your RAM, right? Uh, how much RAM do you have, right? That when we're talking about your memory, we're talking about your RAM memory, we're talking about your random access memory. Uh, and the reason why that memory in your uh, machine is, is called RAM is because the way we access that memory 
and through the hardware is the same way. We can access any memory location arbitrarily with the same number of calculations or the same amount of effort. Uh, in this case, this is uh, the more software calculation of the address, um, but that's the same reason the memory that we're talking about here is random access memory. So again, random access allows us to access any element of the array with the same computational cost. And that's why we call it random access. It's saying we could access it in a random order and it wouldn't cost us any more effectively. Okay, uh, and, and the truth is that is the number one and best benefit of the array implementation of lists. We uh, get this random access, we can jump around and calculate the address of any element very easily um, uh, with very little cost to us. I want to continue our discussion now by thinking, well, what happens if we run out of space in our array? We've maybe made space for 10 integers, but it turns out we needed 20 integers. Then we might want to grow our uh, array by adding more element or more, more memory region to it. Um, the problem with this is, unfortunately, um, that the next segment of memory available or the next chunk of memory that we might want after index n minus 1 here. It's likely already occupied uh, by other program elements. Uh, specifically, it's probably occupied by other program elements of your very own program. When uh, the operating system gives you a chunk of memory, it's going to try and give you one chunk of memory contiguous if it can, and it's going to assign those chunks in order as you get it. So um, if you've got, say, a, a handful of arrays here, maybe the next thing in memory will be another one of your arrays or, or some other variables you're using. So we can't just extend this array into the memory uh, next to it. Um, as a result, what that means is if we want to I get a larger array. If we were doing this ourselves, um, we might then say, ask the ask the compiler uh, and the operating system to assign for us a larger piece of memory. Now, when we do that, we would have to move the current array over into that that new chunk of memory. And so in doing that, uh, we incur a cost, whatever the cost it is to copy the whole array over. And as I have here sort of stated on my slide, the cost of copying the whole array over is going to be the cost of the or the size of the array. So if it has n elements, it will take us order n operations to copy it. So again, as I state here, this is an expensive operation, so it's not one we would want to do uh, very often. This operation, the idea of taking a uh, fixed size array, maybe doubling it in size, uh, copying over the old elements, and then using the new array uh, uh, as a larger version of the array to keep keep adding elements to it. Uh, this is what we might call a dynamic array. And in Java, we call these array lists. This is an array implementation of the list, uh, where if the array list gets full, um, we're going to double it up in size and copy the elements over with this expensive operation. Right, so let's look a little closer at how this uh, works. Um, so we can imagine that when you ask for a new array list, um, that when it is set up, it's set up with actually two, two variables. The first one that we're going to be concerned with here is the capacity. How, how much room is there in the array for the elements that we at, at, at the outset? Now, for our purposes, we're going to imagine that there's only room for one element. Um, in, in all likelihood in practice, it's probably more than that. It's likely a power of two, um, and it's probably a small power of two. Now, which power of two it is, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, an expert on those things, uh, but my guess is it might be 16 or 32 or 64, something like that. So we might start out, when you ask for an array list, uh, you get 64 spaces, maybe 256 spaces, at, uh, um, something like that, uh, at the outset. The purpose of giving you a larger array uh, ahead of time is to avoid doing uh, a lot of the grows that happen early on. Um, so if you start with one, immediately you have to grow to two, and then to four, then to eight, and so on. There's a lot of quick grows there. That's a lot of copying that we can avoid if we just start at 16. Um, and then the first grow we would have to do is 16 to 32, and that got us a lot of space. So hopefully, again, we won't do another grow for a while. 
uh, but for the purposes of our math we're going to assume we start at size 1. It's just, just going to make the calculation a little bit easier. Uh, now this is the capacity of our array. Well, just like any other list, we also keep track of the size. The size is the actual number of elements stored in there. Uh, so the size should always be less than or equal to the capacity. When we add a new element, um, in, again in the simple way, just adding it to the end, we, uh, uh, as long as the size of the list is less than the capacity at the moment, then we have space available and we can just add it very simply. And that's adding it using our random access. So as we already argued, this is going to take us big O of one time or constant time. However, when the size reaches the capacity, if we try and do an add when our size is equal to the capacity, uh, then this is the special case where we need to grow the array. And remember, this is an expensive operation. Uh, this operation is going to take us order of n time, where n is the current size of the, of the array. So what I want to do is I want to look a little bit at how much time this is going to take us um, uh, so let's look a little closer at this. So first of all, uh, what we've just done is we've realized that there's basically two, two different cases that we can encounter when we, uh, when we add to an array list. First, if we're lucky, if the capacity is greater than the current size, then we get to add in the best case scenario, order one. However, every once in a while, we try and add to a full array, and when we do, we get the worst case scenario. The worst case being order n. So typically when we're doing analysis, worst case is what we care about. We want to know what happens in the worst circumstances. However, we've also noticed in this quick analysis, we haven't really got deep into it yet, but just on the side we've noticed these grow operations don't happen very often. Um, at first they maybe do, like I said, one, two, four, eight, those ones happen pretty quickly. But once we get up to say size 1024, we're going to grow up to 2048 and then 4096. We, we have a lot, we have thousands of ads we get to make before we have to do another one of these expensive copy operations. So maybe what we might be more interested in is um, figuring out what the cost of doing a large number of ads. So say we wanted to do 20,000 ads, just a, a big number. How many operations does it take us to do 20,000 ads? Is it going to be something like 20,000, 30,000, 50,000? Or is it going to be something grossly more than that, 400,000, 400,000, you know, 4 million, you know, 20 million? These are all uh, values that are grossly larger. So we want to sort of get a good estimate. How many operations is it going to take us if we want to make 20,000 ads? Now keeping in mind, if we're doing 20,000 ads, we're going to be doing a lot of the cheap ads, but we're also going to be doing a whole collection of the more expensive ads where we need to grow the list as we go. Now, what this an analysis technique that I'm, I'm talking about here is, is called amortized. Uh, analysis and amortized analysis comes from uh, comes from uh, accounting and uh, finance. Where say maybe you're a large corporation, uh, maybe you're the University of Washington. You want to uh, buy a new building uh, to put some rooms in. Maybe the the building costs thirty million dollars uh, to build. Uh, if you put that on your ledger at the end of the quarter, if you spent $30 million that quarter, um, it looks pretty bad. You probably didn't earn $30 million, so all of a sudden it looks like you lost $30 million that quarter. Uh, your shareholders, well, UW doesn't have shareholders, maybe you know, so whoever it is gets upset that it looks like you lost money. Uh, well, to make things a little bit e uh, easier, make it not look like you lost that money, that's a good investment. Uh, what we do in terms of accounting is we amortize the cost of that building. We say to ourselves, well, we're actually going to use that building for 30 years. So let's say we spread the cost of that million, of the $30 million over the 30 years. Well, now we've reduced that cost down to a, a million bucks. And that's sort of the same thing we're doing here with our uh, array is when we grow it in size, that's like building that new building. It's like saying, hey, we want to make room 
for new ads that are going to be coming in in the future and we want to make enough room so how much room do we make we that's where we made the decision to double in size um, that's going to make sure that we have a lot of time before we have to do this operation again and we're going to amortize the cost of that grow operation over the cost of all the ads we get to make in the meantime until we have to do it again and so that's going to be called an amortized analysis and that's what i want to uh, do right now so the idea here is that we're going to uh, add n elements to our list where n is large i said imagine 20,000, but we're going to pick a couple other numbers here so again we might start with a small small size and each time we're going to uh, every once in a while we're going to have to do this grow operation and we want to know what the cost of the total is the, the, the cost of doing the simple ads plus the cost of all these grows. So to do this I want to uh, uh, start with just doing some simple numerical calculations here before we get to n in general. So let's pick a, maybe an easier one to calculate than 20,000. Let's start with n equals uh, 100. All right, I think I might want to do a little bit of calculation here, but one thing that might be helpful for us to realize is that there's actually going to be two kinds, uh, two kinds of ads that we're going to be able to do here. Uh, the first one is the simple cost ads. So remember our order of one ad, which I'm just going to say cost one actually to do that ad. And then we also have the, the grow operation, which I'm going to say is order of n. Okay, and again, for simplicity, uh, I'm going to ignore the constant that might involve that. I'm just going to say that's going to take us n operations. Now, the other thing I'm going to uh, mention is that when we do an ad, we're going to fall in one of the two cases. We're either going to be able to do a simple ad, which is just cost us one, or we're going to have to do the grow, and then we're still going to have to do the add. We still have to add the new element in after we do the grow. So I'm going to split these costs into two. So say we're doing, uh, again, n equals 100. Um, then for the simple ads, we know that we're actually going to do 100 of them. Even though some of those might in incur a grow, uh, every one after the grow, we still have to do the one. So I'm going to split every a simple add off and just call that a hundred operations and now we can start thinking about the other operations that we're going to have to do and those are going to include uh, when we first do our grow our arrays of size one so we'll have to copy one element over uh, the next time it'll be two then four then eight sixteen thirty two and sixty four oops and 64 and we want to know now 64 is where we end right because uh, after we grow we copy the 64 elements over we now have an array of size 128 and that's big enough to hold our elements in so we want to know what this is going to be equal to which means we need to know what this sum is going to be equal to okay and I'm going to cheat a little bit. I know what that sum is going to be equal to. Um, that's going to be 100 plus uh, 127, uh, which is equal to 227. So my, uh, the total number of ads, or the total number of operations that we are going to calculate here, uh, if we want to do 100 ads into our list using this uh, dynamic array uh, strategy, uh, is going to take us 227 and maybe uh, I'll just do a quick eyeball here that's a little more than twice uh, so if I had a hundred here it's 200 that's a little more than twice okay um, all right so I've also included that in calculation in my slide uh, so we've got the same ideas up there all right I've chosen n equals 1024 uh, because it uh, it is a power of two, which means after one of our uh, after one of our doubling operations, we will have grown to exactly 1,024. And so after we do the 1,024th add, we will be completely full. Uh, if we did one more add, 1,025, 
then we would do another grow operation. And we might want to check that next. So I'm going to do 124 first, and then maybe we'll think what happens if we did one more after that. So let's see, again, uh, if we're going to do our, our calculation like we did before, we know that we're going to have to still do 1,024 basic ads. Okay. But now I'm going to go and I'm going to try and make things a little bit easier on ourselves. I'm going to write this as a sum. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to say it's the i equals 0. Now remember, what's our, our sum going to look like? It's going to be like a 1 plus a 2 plus a, uh, oops, plus a 4 uh, and so on here. These are powers of 2. So it looks like here that I've got a power of 2, 2 to the i. Also, since we start at 1, uh, I've started at i equals 0 because 2 to the 0 is 1. Okay. Now where do we stop? Now notice we don't need to do the grow of, that will be of size 1024. That would be if we had one more element. right? Instead, we just have to do the one before that, and that would be 512, if, if you know your powers of 2. Um, but that's also 2 to the 9. Okay, 2 to the 9 is 512. So we want to know a little bit what is this sum equal to. Well, again, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I know what that sum is equal to. We still have the 1024, but we get the 1023 is what the sum is equal to. So in total, we have 2047 as the number of operations. Now again, we might think, let's compare those number of operations to uh, n. Our n is 1024. This number of operations is exactly one less than 2 times n. 2 times n is 2048. So, so this value here, interestingly, maybe we'll just put here, this happens to be equal to 2n minus 1. Okay. Now remember, this was our best case. This is when we filled up right full. We, don't, we didn't do that extra costly grow. So let's maybe, let's go down and consider a little bit more. Let's say we did n equals 1,025. And it looks like we're going to get slightly different mass. We're in 1,025 here. Plus now, we still get this sum, but now we're going to go up to 10 because we have to do the one extra grow. So I'm going to take this number and add on the cost of the extra grow. Well, what is it? That's this. So we actually add on here 2047. Now what's that? Let me do a quick, quick math in my head here. We got a 2 with a carry. We got a 72. It looks like we got 3072. All right, now 3,072 is, again, looking at our n here, is a little bit less than 3n. It's actually, again, if we're being very precise here, it's uh, 3n uh, minus 3, or 3 times n minus 1 might be another way of looking at that. Um, so this is, again, we're just doing some investigations here. Um, but in this case, we've, we, I, we haven't proven this, but this n equals 1024 was actually the best possible case. We filled up our array, but then it was perfectly full and we stopped. So that's the best we can do, and we saw it was a little less than 2 times n. This one's actually going to be the worst we can do then, because it said we filled up, but we didn't stop. We just added one more, so it's the, the, all that extra space we made is as as empty as it possibly could be. Because of that, uh, the size is almost three times, uh, the number of operations we took is almost three times uh, the total uh, uh, number of elements we've added here. But interesting en enough, these numbers are pretty close together, two times and three times. We've only done about one and more work, which maybe makes sense because the extra work we really did was just copying these elements over, about n elements over. So, um, uh, interesting, let's take a look at uh, uh, maybe the general case now. Can we prove this now in general? Well, to do that, let's think a little bit about our formulas that we've come up with. Now, we had two terms in the formula. If we were going to do n adds, first of all, we had the simple adds, which were n, plus, then we had this sum, and I want to be careful with my sum here, 
It started at zero. I'm not going to really say what it's going to yet, uh, but it was two to the i. All right. Now, what was uh, what is our top bound here? Okay. Well, it depends on n, of course. Um, we need enough space to fill up n. Okay. Now, this this is a little bit a little bit complicated, so maybe we'll just go over to the side here and we'll think. We, we know that what we're calculating is we need some power, uh, we need some power of 2. Okay. And we want that power of 2 to be such that it's bigger, well, bigger than or equal to n, because we need it to be enough space than n. But we also want it to be the closest power of 2. So we want it to be the, the exact closest one. So the one below us must be too small. It can't fit n, but the one above uh, or equal to is the one of the right size. So we kind of want to figure out what that value is. Now the interesting thing here is we can now, for this equation, we can take the log of both sides. If we do, we're going to get d minus 1 is less than log base 2. And what we see here is that what we're looking for is some d that's greater than or equal to log base 2 of n, um, uh, where d minus 1 is less than that. Now again, that might be a little bit uh, hard for us to see if we haven't worked with this before. But what we'll notice is that if we took the ceiling of this, then that will give us exactly the d that we want. So the value that we're looking for here is the ceiling of log n. Um, we need to be careful here, actually, um, because actually we don't need to grow up to the ceiling of log n. It was actually minus 1. So remember in our 1,000 or 1,024 case, we only grew up to 512. The last term was 512. And in the 1,025 case, our last term was 1,024, even though we needed space up to 2,048. So uh, we actually get the minus 1 in there as well. We don't do the last row. All right, we can now try and simplify this a little bit. So uh, one thing we might want to do is we need to look a little closer at this formula here. And this one's a little bit messy, so I'm going to, on the side here, I'm going to write a slightly different one. We're going to have the sum i equals 0. And here I'm just going to put mm, n for now of 2 to the i. Right? Now this is called a geometric series. And a geometric series has a uh, well-known, well there are many geometric series, but this one has a well-known closed form expression, uh, which is uh, 2 uh, to the n plus 1, the next power up, power of 2 up, uh, minus 1. Okay. And we can use this now uh, to simplify this summation, which I'll do in a second. Uh, but this sum here, this geometric series, um, there, there, you might want to memorize it, you might want to have it written down somewhere easy. I usually try and re I, I remember it uh, by remembering that this corresponds uh, to a binary number in particular. If we have a, a binary number like this, uh, with a bunch of ones here, specifically uh, with n ones here. Actually, technically, in this case, it would be n plus one n's, okay, or n plus one ones. If we had this here, um, then the the sum that we have written here corresponds to the value of this binary number. Okay, remember, because this is going to be place value two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, all the way up to say two to the n if there's n bits here. Uh, so what we're really asking when we're asking what this sum is, is asking what this binary number is. And this binary number, we might not know what it is, but if we add 1 to it, we'll realize that what we get is, again, this binary number, which we can quite clearly see is the next power of 2 up. Okay, how did we get there? We added 1 to them, so we need to subtract 1 if we want to know what the value of this term is. So I use that to remember this closed form expression, and then we can use that uh, to go ahead and simplify here. Uh, we're going to get plus 
Now this whole sum, using this formula here, but keeping in mind we still have that log n here, we're going to get uh, uh, 2 to the ceiling of log n uh, plus 1 uh, minus 1. Oops, I got my minus 1 and my plus 1 backwards. This plus 1 is coming from here, the minus 1 obviously coming from up there. I knew I had both of them. One's going to cancel out with the other. Okay. Uh, and on the bottom, I don't want to miss out. I still have my big, this is the minus 1. Okay. Continuing. Still got the n here. Um, I want to approximate this. So actually, I'm going to make this a less than or equal to now. I want to come up with an upper bound here because I want to get rid of the floor. If I get rid of the floor, or sorry, the ceiling, if I get rid of the ceiling, then my 2 and my log are going to be able to cancel out because this is log base 2. So if I get rid of the ceiling, I want to know what is the ceiling less than or equal to. And so again, I might want to check my notes, see if I remember what is the ceiling of x uh, less than or equal to. Well, ceilings might make things bigger uh, than x. But it might, it, it's not going to make it bigger than x by more than 1. So this is going to be less than or equal to x uh, plus 1. So even though these two are going to cancel out, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to say plus uh, 2 log n plus 1. I'm approximating away this ceiling uh, with this formula here. Okay, Let's not forget my minus 1. Uh, all right, uh, continuing here. Uh, maybe let's just be careful in case it's been a while since we practiced. Let's change that plus 1. That's going to become a 2 out front. Uh, and then we'll finish off with uh, re recognizing that 2 to the log n, those cancel out. We just get n. So what do we get here? n plus, looks like, 2n uh, minus 1, which obviously is 3n minus 1. So what did we say? We said in general the number of operations, this was our formula for the number of operations right here, in general after calculating using some of our formulas here, uh, simplifying down, we said the number of operations to do n adds will always be less than 3n minus 1. Well luckily for us, that's order n. So to do n adds is order n, then that means on average, or more specifically with our amortized analysis, to do one add, if we did one add, it would be order one. Okay, on average. Keeping in mind every once in a while we get that expensive add, but on average uh, we have order one. Or another way of saying that, in the worst case, we're doing at most three operations for each add. And that's that's definitely good. Uh, Alright, so uh, we were here. Uh, I've again included some of that. Uh, I again have included uh, that math here on the slides uh, so we can review that. Um, and uh, and that ends what I wanted to say about uh, dynamic lists. Uh, I want to uh, finish by just making a comment or two uh, uh, about or a contrast with linked lists. So linked lists uh, operate differently. Uh, linked lists involves uh, a linked structure, linked nodes usually we call them, um, and, and the links consist of addresses to other nodes. So uh, the dynamic growth of a linked list is handled uh, quite easily. Whenever we want to add a new element, we merely allocate uh, memory for a single node, uh, which is large enough to store, say, our integer plus a reference to the next node. Um, and, we, and then we store the element there. Uh, the worst case cost of doing an add in this regard is order one. Um, just like we put some effort into showing that the average cost of adding uh, for an array list is order one, uh, it's straightforward to see the worst case cost for adding to a linked list is order one. Again, I'll be very clear here when we're adding to the end of the list. This is sort of a depiction of what a linked list might look like in memory, uh, where we might have index zero, 
uh, points to index one, which points to index two, and so on. Um, and what that means is the elements that we have stored in our uh, linked list are stored sort of willy-nilly all over memory and we cannot predict where the next element is given where the current one is. We can only find it by following the reference. What this means is the uh, random access calculation that we saw was so convenient and useful uh, when using an array list or an array implementation cannot be used for linked lists. And so the, the main breakdown we have for linked lists is we lose random access. And specifically what that means is when we uh, want to access an element in the linked list, say we want to access it by its index, we want to access element i. Well, the time it's going to take us to access that element is order of i, the amount of time it takes us to iterate uh, to that element. Uh, with one exception, if we have a doubly linked list, we can iterate from the back, but still uh, it's the closest from the front or the back. It may still take us halfway through the entire list. So that's the main drawback of the linked list model. Um, and so uh, I want to complete this video uh, with uh, maybe a, a couple conclusions. First, uh, any data structure that you implement, uh, basically you have the potential for two uh, ways you might want to implement it. Either uh, with an underlying array, like we saw for an array list, or with an underlying linked structure of some case, in some, in some case. So you get some kind of structure, uh, some kind of class that you create, uh, and you link them together. Uh, if you're going to do that, uh, a typical way to do that is to make use of a node class. And here I've made a very simple private node class, private nodes are, are usually the right way to do it when you're working in, in a language like uh, Java. You want to protect access to the nodes. You're, you don't want your users to know what a node is or have to know what a node is. Uh, only the data structure itself should know what the node is. Uh, but here uh, is maybe an example of a private node class uh, where we have some item here I'm assuming generically typed. So some item here um, that you want to store, maybe an integer, maybe a character, maybe a string. Um, and then you have a reference uh, to the next node. Uh, and here I've called that next. Uh, this is a very, very simple linked structure, uh, one we might use in a linked list. Uh, but other linked structures will just have different ways of handling the links. A uh, doubly linked list might have a next and a previous. Um, you may have a tree that has a left and a right child. Uh, you may have, a, in generally, uh, you may have a, a graph with an adjacency list of just a list of other nodes that you're connected to. But in, in the basic uh, realm of, of data structure design, uh, we really have two underlying choices, either an array implementation uh, or a linked structure implementation. All right, uh, that brings us to the end of this video. Uh, I do want to continue in my next video uh, with some discussion of sorting procedures and analysis of uh, uh, algorithms. So we'll return in the next video to talk about that. So thank you and we'll see you in the next video.